to this service of morning worship on the first Sunday of Epiphany from St James's Church here in Winscombe, but we are also All Saints in Sanford and St John's Church in Churchill. I, my name is Sarah and I'm a lay worship assistant in this parish. Now you can follow our service of morning, our service of morning worship on our service sheet, which you can find on our website, www.windsandchurches.org.uk. And now we'll take a moment of quiet just to gather ourselves before we start the service. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And join in me with saying, and also with you. I'm now going to light the Christmas candle. We have our four candles for representing each Sunday of Advent that happened in December. And now I'm lighting the Christmas candle. The one that represents Christ coming to us, the light in the world. I have lit this candle to represent we are the people of God for past, present and future generations. As a light of joy, we celebrate the good news of the birth of Jesus Christ, who brings hope, peace, reconciliation and love to the world. And please join with me, Lord Jesus, light of lights, you have come among us, help us who live by your light to shine as light in your world. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. And now we're going to have the Epiphany hymn, Brightest and Best are the Sons of the Morning. And the words are on the screen so you can sing or follow as you like at home.
As we prepare to bring our failings before God, let us think of all that we have said, or perhaps not said, done or not done. All the things that might have caused hurt, confusion, dismay. Things that we know have let us down in the eyes of God. Christ, the light of the world, has come to dispel the darkness of our hearts. Let us turn to the light and confess our wrongdoing. God, our Father, you sent your Son full of grace and truth. Forgive our failure to receive him. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, our Saviour, you were born in poverty and laid in a manger. Forgive our greed and rejection of your ways. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Spirit of love, your servant Mary responded joyfully to your call. Forgive the hardness of our hearts. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You come in word and sacrament to strengthen us in holiness. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You will come in glory with salvation for your people. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may God forgive us. Christ, renew us, and the Spirit, enable us to grow in love. Amen. And now we're going to say the Gloria, so please join with me. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And now the collect or special prayer for the first Sunday of Epiphany, the baptism of Christ. Heavenly Father, at the Jordan, you revealed Jesus as your son. May we recognize him as our Lord and know ourselves to be your beloved children. Through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. And now, Hugh is going to read our Gospel, which is from St Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 to 11. The reading is taken from St Mark, chapter 1, beginning at the fourth verse. John the Baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptised by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee 
and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove, like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Hugh. Today, our Gospel reading is the story of Jesus' baptism by John. It would seem that John the Baptist's ministry was extremely efficient and many were flocking to listen to him and to submit to his baptism. Why? William Barclay suggests three reasons. Firstly, that John was a man who lived his message. His whole life was a protest against the contemporary life of his time. He lived in the wilderness, which was between the centre of Judea and the Dead Sea, and was one of the most terrible deserts in the world. John was no city dweller. He was a man from the desert and from its solitudes and its desolations. He was a man who had given himself a chance to hear the voice of God. Secondly, the clothes John wore, the garment woven of camel's hair and the leather belt around his waist. These were not the same as those worn by the fashionable orators of the day. Instead, his clothes reflected the ancient prophets who had lived close to the great simplicities of life and who had avoided soft and effeminate luxuries. Thirdly, the food he ate, the locusts and the wild honey, they were simple in the extreme. The locusts could have been the animals that the law allowed to be eaten, but they could also have been a kind of bean or nut, the carob, which was the food of the poorest of the poor. The honey could have been the honey the wild bees made, or maybe it was a kind of sweet sap that comes from the bark of certain trees. But as William Barclay points out, it doesn't matter what the words precisely mean. We just know that John's diet was extremely simple. <clears throat> so John emerged and people were drawn to listen to a man like that. The people of Israel were well aware that for 300 years the voice of prophecy had been silent. They were waiting for some authentic word from God. And in John they heard it. John had come from God, and to hear him was to know it. Another reason his message was so effective was because he was completely humble. His own verdict on himself was that he was not fit for the duty of a slave. Sandals were made simply of leather soles, fastened to the foot by straps passing through the toes. The roads were unsurfaced, and in dry weather they were dust heaps, whilst in wet weather rivers of mud. To remove the sandals was the work and office of a slave. John asked nothing for himself, but everything for the Christ whom he proclaimed. John's complete self-effacement, his utter lostness in his message, compelled people to listen. He also pointed to something and someone beyond himself. He told men that his baptism drenched them in water, but one was coming who would drench them in the Holy Spirit. And while water could cleanse a person's body, the Holy Spirit could cleanse their life and self and heart. 
John's one aim was not to occupy the centre stage himself, but to try to connect people with the one who was greater and stronger than him. And they listened to him because he pointed not to himself, but to the one whom all people need. However, the act of Jesus being baptised brings up a problem. In those days, baptism was a ritual of repentance for non-Jews and was for those converting to Judaism. Immersion was needed because it represented a change in status in regards to purifying, restoration, and it qualified those baptised for full religious participation in the life of the community. What had such a baptism to do with Jesus? Not only was he a Jew, he was the sinless one, and therefore such a baptism was surely unnecessary and, one might think, quite irrelevant. Again, I turn to William Barclay, who suggests the following. Firstly, it marked the moment of decision. For 30 years, Jesus had stayed in Nazareth, working and living as a loving and dutiful son. But he must have been conscious that the time for him to go out into the wider world had to come. And he must have been waiting for a sign. The emergence of John was that sign. This, Jesus saw, was the moment when he had to leave Nazareth and set out upon his task. He knew that at this moment, God was summoning him. Secondly, although Jesus didn't need to repent from sin, he knew he had to identify with the movement that was promoting a return to God. It was the time to step up and receive the approval of God. And God's voice came directly to Jesus. Matthew writes of the same incident, but in his gospel, the voice says, this is my beloved son. Here in Mark's version, the voice says, you are my beloved son. God is speaking directly to Jesus, unmistakably approving. Thirdly, this was the moment that Christ was equipped by God. The Holy Spirit descended upon him and descended as a dove might descend. A dove, the symbol of gentleness. In the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, John's preaching was fiery. His message was a message of doom who the, for those who did not follow God's word. His message was not of good news. But here in Mark, all we are told is that John is proclaiming a baptism for the repentance of sins. This is far gentler. And I think it helps us see the contrast between the tub thumping of the Old Testament prophets and the future ministry of Jesus that will promote forgiveness, service to others, acceptance, love. God's beloved son will conquer, but the conquest will be the conquest of love. For God's Son has come to the world as a tiny, vulnerable baby, an alien, in the old sense of the word, a foreigner. Then he has lived an unknown life for 30 years in the community of Nazareth, until now, when God has called him to be recognised as his son. But that recognition is not one of trumpets and cymbals. Instead, God tells him, you are my beloved son. And the Holy Spirit comes upon him in the form of a dove. Jesus's ministry will tell of God's love and forgiveness and hope for mankind. 
But it will also tell us that we have to live up to that love. We have to be prepared to change in order to live in the way that God wants us to live, putting service to him and to others at the forefront of our lives. Life at the moment seems very out of kilter, rather dark and strange, and it's difficult to see the light. Many of us are feeling forlorn and fearful, but we mustn't lose heart. God is with us, and if we look, we can see him, not only in the big things, such as the amazing achievements of the scientists, but also in so many of the small pleasures that we still experience on a daily basis. We can be confident that God is a loving Father, and through Jesus, he has given us the spirit of peace to calm our fears and to reassure. As we prayed earlier in the collect for this Sunday, Lord, at the Jordan, you revealed Jesus as your son. May we recognize him as our Lord and know ourselves to be your beloved children. Amen. And now we're going to declare our faith in God. So please join with me as we say, we believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, Joe is going to lead us in our time of prayer. Everlasting God, as we focus on the baptism of our Lord, let us remember our own baptisms and our calling to be Christians. May we walk in your way live our life for you and be mindful of your presence day by day. Heavenly Father, you sent your Son to guide your people, just as you sent a star to guide the wise men to worship him. We pray for our leaders and those who make decisions on our behalf, that you will guide them with your light to seek wisdom, justice and peace. Send your Holy Spirit to guide the church leaders and PCCs in our three churches throughout the coming year, as they look ahead and discern your will for our benefice. We pray especially for the future of Churchill. We know that this coming year will bring significant challenges and changes, and we pray that you will always be present as we take one more step along our journey of faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we thank you for the dedication of doctors and nurses and our frontline workers, many of whom are once again feeling overwhelmed by the number of patients for whom they are caring. We pray for all those involved in the vaccination programme and that through their efforts, the virus will eventually come under control. As we have been remembering during the Christmas season, even in the midst of our darkest fears, hope brings light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we give thanks for your presence with us in our communities and homes and in our lives. As we face another period of lockdown, we pray that your love will sustain us as we adapt to the challenges that this brings. We pray for those for whom lockdown means further loneliness and isolation and those who are struggling financially or emotionally. Guide our relationships with family and neighbours 
especially those in trouble or need. Help us to be understanding of others and to play our part in making our neighbourhoods places of trust and friendship where all are known and cared for. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, we also remember today all those involved in education as teaching and learning are disrupted by the virus. We pray for students and children who are disappointed that they cannot return to school, college or university. Bless our teachers and support staff as they both care for the children of key workers and encourage our young people of all ages to continue learning online in the coming weeks. We think too of parents involved in supporting home learning and ask that they too feel your encouragement at all times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we pray for all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. We pray that they will know the presence of your Son alongside them and the power of the Holy Spirit within them, bringing peace and healing and help and encouragement for those caring for them at their time of need. As a church community, we pray especially for Bishop Peter, Jeff, Dennis, Sarah B, James, Henry S, Celia, Chris G, Pauline K, Reverend Tim Jessiman and his wife Elaine, David, Jackie, Jim, Clive, Myra, Pat G, Pippa, Katie B, Russ A and Emma A. And we are thankful for your many answers to prayers as loved ones return home from hospital and recover from operations. Thinking in particular of Liz and hoping that each day will bring her more strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we say together now, the family prayer that our Lord taught his disciples. Please join with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And our final hymn is a well-known carol for Epiphany. I know it bears no relation to our theme of the baptism of Christ, but I think it's cheering for us all to hear and join in with this very popular carol, We Three Kings. Oh, 
say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and always. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. It's been really good to have you with us and we look forward to seeing you again. And thank you also to all those involved in the recording of this service. Thank you.